Hello again, welcome back to one more day of daily Bible study this week. We're looking at the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 3, going to start at verse 14, go to the end of the chapter. We're looking at the last of the seven letters to the churches in Asia Minor, this one to the church in Laodicea, uh, one of the more well-known of these letters uh, for a variety of reasons. But before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, uh, I am not the first person to see a comparison between uh, the church in my life and the world uh, with this church in Laodicea. Lord, help us to learn what we need to learn. Uh, Lord, help us to be um, warm for you. Lord, let us follow you, and Lord, let us pursue you. And Lord, when you come to us, as you always come first to us before we can even begin to do anything ourselves, Lord, let us receive you for who you are. Lord, strengthen us from the inside, and Lord, help us to follow you in all things. Lord, we ask you to be with us, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So there are kind of two, two bits of this that are particularly well known, and see if you recognize them. We read, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, there are two main bits here that get highlighted. And I made the comment a couple of days ago about this the church in Sardis being something that I, I have heard at least people comparing more directly to you know, the church in America, precisely because it is easy to be a church that is asleep. It is easy to be a Christian that is asleep. And that seems to be the problem in Sardis. Um, you will, all, you will also hear from me right now, but also I'm not by any means the only person who could suggest that the Laodicean church uh, also shares in some of this uh, of the American issue, that, that the American church may also be equally caught up in the Laodicean era, era as well as that of that of Sardis. And that is this idea of, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you're not cold or hot, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And I think that that is fascinating because I think that there is a temptation to say, if, you know, um, is, it, is it better to be an open atheist, a committed atheist, or to be a lukewarm Christian. And I think that on one level, I think it is tempting to say, obviously, obviously it's better to be a lukewarm Christian than, uh, than a committed atheist, because at least you're closer uh, to the truth at that point. And at least on one reading of this passage, that's not necessarily the case. Um, this idea of, in fact, it might be better to be a committed atheist than a lukewarm Christian. And, and that's fascinating because, you know, I, it's one of those things where I, <sighs> I hear people talk about things. These are my objections to the Christian faith and all the rest. And, and when I have those kinds of conversations, I know there's always a possibility that by laying things out and by trying to clarify the issues, at least as I see them, that there's always a possibility someone's going to walk away from that encounter saying, boy, I, I'm, I'm even more committed to my non-Christian stance than I was before. And obviously, I would prefer them to be sympathetic to Christianity. And yet, I would rather have someone with clarity be committed to their course of action, committed to their life, their faith, whether of God or of, of something other than God, than to be uncommitted. Uh, somebody who's uncommitted, you wonder if you can have a real conversation with them. Like if somebody is a committed Muslim, they have they have beliefs, they have convictions. You, they at least know what they are, and they know what would violate them, and that at least can be a productive, interesting conversation where maybe we at least can communicate with one another, even if we don't convince one another. Um, somebody who is lukewarm, who says, "Oh yeah, Jesus, I guess." I mean. It doesn't make that much of a difference in my life, but you know, I guess I guess Jesus is okay. You know, then then there's a question as to what exactly are they going to do with that information? Are they going to actually follow Jesus, or is it just going to be a thing that floats in their life? And can a faith that just kind of floats in your life ever be the faith of the New Testament? And I don't think so. And and so I have it's been a little while as you know I'm about to come up again on on reading um, the the uh, Kierkegaard's Attack upon Christendom and reading his letters to the fatherland and his publication of the, of the moment. Um, but I'm coming up on it soon. And, but that's one of the things that every time I read that, I get reminded of this idea of, 
you know, there are worse things than um, outward hostility to the gospel. And that is a lackluster, indifferent commitment to the gospel to say, I guess I could take the Bible or leave it. I guess I could take Jesus or leave it. I guess I could live as a Christian or not, depending on what's convenient for me in this exact moment. Uh, there is at least one way of reading this passage, for example, that says, no, that's bad. That is worse. It is worse to be so uncommitted that you can be swayed this way or that. Um, so I think it's fascinating, this idea of that this being lukewarm is, he says, I wish you were cold or hot. Hot makes sense. If we're warm for Jesus, we're hot for Jesus. But to be cold, I'd rather you were cold than lukewarm. And I think that that is a jarring idea. And I think if we allow that to really set inside of us, uh, it will challenge us in those moments when we are uh, Christians uh, merely in a culturally, um, you know, inoffensive way. That uh, we say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm religious, but I'm not a fanatic about it. You know, I'm, I'm religious, but I don't really change the way I live. You know, I live like everybody else, but I, you know, I, I put Jesus, you know, uh, on my sheet of paper where I describe myself. Um, the other thing here is that, that, that um, it talks about this idea of, I stand at the door and knock. This notion is of, this, motion, this idea of, you know, Jesus comes and knocks on the door. And we either let him in or we don't. Um, and I think that's a, a beautiful picture of, of the notion of salvation. Because on the one hand, Jesus knocks. Um, we, don't, we don't make the gospel. We don't make salvation. Jesus offers us salvation. And yet... There does need to be a response to that. Um, it's a response that's empowered by grace. You know, we would not be able to answer the door if he didn't knock. You know, uh, we would not have the, the power to do anything in response if he did not give it. Uh, and yet, I think it's important that we realize that, that as he knocks, we do have a certain role to play here in receiving Jesus. So I, just, I, I think it's a, a beautiful, uh, strong, this is a very challenging letter to the Laodicean church. And, um, and I think that it would do us well to consider what is in this letter uh, with some frequency, to come back to it with some frequency and be reminded of this critique. And so we, would, we should pray that, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, that brings to the end of these, these seven letters. And starting next week, we're going to kind of go into the body of Revelation proper. And uh, you're going to see me shrug my shoulders a lot, I am sure. Uh, but I, you know, come back again next week, I guess. If you want to come see what might be a long, slow-motion train wreck uh, of biblical interpretation, um, by all means, come and join me with that. But that's all for today, and that's all for this week. Come back next week. We will have more of the book of Revelation. Have a good day.